I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York. He was one of New York's finest, a young NYPD cop who just married his girlfriend and welcomed a baby girl. I was a very good husband, I was a good father, I provided for my family. Until his sick and twisted double life was exposed. You talk about kidnapping women, killing them, cooking them, and eating them. Today, I grill New York's infamous cannibal cop. Busted by the FBI after his own wife made the chilling discovery she was one of his targets. Your wife found photos of herself. His wife, her friends, written a menu for murder. He's talking about doing terrible things to people. Is he a dangerous real life Hannibal the cannibal or just a man with a morbid imagination? Yo, this is normal. People don't choose the things they're aroused by. Right now. Andrea Isom, sir, with Crime Watch yeah. Daily. Jason Matero with Crime Watch Daily. This. I'm Elizabeth, I'm here with Crime Watch. I'm Michelle from Crime Watch Daily. Anna Garcia from Crime Watch. Is Crime Watch oh, Daily. Stay off my property. We'll find you again. We always do. Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. We start today with all new details on a case that not only fascinated the city of New York, it made headlines around the world. An NYPD officer accused of plotting to kidnap and eat his victims. Today, I've got a new interview with a so-called cannibal cop, and we want to warn you some of the details in this next story are quite graphic and disturbing. Kidnap, rape, actions, kill and eat women. Speak louder than words. I was never going to act out these fantasies. Or do they? It's an unprecedented case. You cannot prosecute people based on their disturbing and sick thoughts. That will leave investigators wondering where fantasy ends and reality begins. Do you think he was capable of kidnapping, assaulting, killing and eating a woman. I think anyone is capable of anything. Wild headlines. It's never something that I thought would come back to blow up to this level. And nickname notoriety. The cannibal cop. That's always going to stay with me forever. How the hell did you get yourself into this? Three months before the scandalous story broke, NYPD officer Gilberto Valley, known as Gil to his friends and family, is busy working the night beat in Harlem's Upper West Side. Were you a good cop? I was a great cop. I was well respected. I was very proud of my career. I was respected by my peers, by my supervisors, by the community. I was very proud. I enjoyed being a police officer very much. And at just 28 years old, Gil passes his sergeant's exam. The potential promotion and bump in pay will come in handy. Gil recently married his sweetheart of two years, Kathleen Mangan, and they've just welcomed a baby girl. I was a very good husband. I was a good father. I provided for my family. I did everything a man was supposed to do, and I loved doing it. Life is good for the Valley family from Queens, New York. I uh, lived a normal, typical American life. Normal being the operative word. I had this thing going on on the side, these chat rooms. They were done anonymously through a, a screen name. I didn't know any of the people I was communicating with other than their screen names, and that was it. Well, not exactly. Those chats were in the context of fetish chat rooms. One of NYPD's finest is leading a double life. It was graphic, it was brutal. On the dark web. I mean, how do you even know where to go to discuss these things? There's a pornography website. A website has related links. So I get curious, I click on related links, and you know, one thing leads to another. And Gil is on the Russian website, darkfetishnet.com. It's a forum for adults to discuss their wildest fantasies and fetishes. And on this private members only site, the freakier, the better. You talk about kidnapping. Yeah women, putting them in a suitcase, delivering them for a gang rape, and then killing them. Yes, killing them, but it gets much darker. Cooking them and eating them. 
AKA cannibalism. Again, it's very graphic, brutal stuff. It was never anything real, it was all fictional. For two years, Gil has been surfing the savage site, gawking at gruesome photos of women appearing to be bound and eaten. Gil admits it's not everyone's cup of tea, or in this case, pound of flesh. Gil, this is normal. Um, For a cop. You know, would it matter if I was a plumber, if, if I was an accountant? But you're, I mean, you were a cop. But people don't choose the things they're aroused by. Everyone has their own things. People don't choose it. And while many view this as a sick, twisted world, Gil claims it became a normal part of his everyday routine. I come home from work after midnight as a police officer, I'm, I'm kind of wound up. So I never go right to sleep. No police officer who works that shift goes right to sleep. But not that many police officers engage in this kind of activity either. Right, that's fair, but people can... Why not watch a movie or sports or something? Yeah, no, I did that some nights too. I wasn't on the computer every single night. But on many nights, according to computer records, Gil is logged on from midnight to well into the pre-dawn hours, talking to his new friends. What was your screen name? It was uh, Girl Meat Hunter. Your screen name was Girl Meat Hunter? Yes. The scary screen name seemed to fit, considering the average exchange between Gil and another profile user named Ali Khan. Gil's messenger name pops up as MHAL52 and begins with a truly shocking message. And I want to warn you, it's graphic. He writes, I have longed to butcher and cook female meat. His buddy Ali responds, young women are good, nothing too big and fat. American meat has its own taste. I'll make a good meal for you. Gil types back, I'm dying to taste some girl meat. Gil's wife and baby are sleeping in the next room while the maniacal messages flood the computer screen. Did you engage in any of the stuff with your wife at all? No. It's a secret cyber world, and Gil intends to keep it that way. Cop by day, want to be cannibal by night. It's not something I ever wanted to volunteer because I was afraid what people would think. They would see me as some kind of outcast or a freak. It's like two totally different people. Journalist and Crime Watch Daily legal analyst Amy Dash covered the Gill Valley case, and she was the only reporter to stay in regular contact with a disgraced NYPD officer during his entire time behind bars. When I reached out to him as a journalist, and he just came off as the most normal person. And I thought, this is so bizarre, because there were some sick things going through this guy's head. In one of the many letters between Valley and Dash, he gives us an inside look into the mindset of the shamed ex-cop, writing, I wake up every morning wanting to drive my head through the wall for being so stupid. Valley explains it to me, saying what's sick to some people is sexually gratifying to others. I have no problem saying my thoughts are deviant, they're unusual, they're abnormal, but they don't affect who I am in real life. This was something I never planned on telling anyone. And then it happens. Officer Valley's two worlds collide. She found the internet history of the kind of websites I was looking at. From there, so that led to her finding the chats. The clean cop's dark and dirty side is exposed. So here you had someone who's sworn to protect and serve, and he's talking about doing terrible things to people, hurting people, raping people, wanting to eat people. Coming up. We don't know whether he's dangerous or not from this point going forward. It's a dark discovery on the dark web. Your wife found photos of herself. Yes. And her friends. Was the cannibal cop's fantasy about to turn into a horrifying reality? He was surveilling these women. The wife of NYPD officer Gilberto Valley does a little searching on the computer, and what she finds is beyond creepy. Her husband is not only talking to people about kidnapping and sexually assaulting women, but eating them as well. Yes, cannibalism. The big question, were these disgusting thoughts about to become a gruesome reality? And once again, some of the details you're about to hear are quite disturbing. NYPD officer Gil Valley is living a secret life. Cop by day, aspiring cannibal by night. Until his deviant desires are discovered by his wife. And then this horrifying revelation. She's one of his targets. 
How did she find out you were involved in all this? She installed spyware on my computer. Why did she feel the need to install spyware? She thought I was having an affair. An affair would have been a relief compared to the terrifying things Gil's wife ultimately uncovered. You talked about kidnapping her and her friends, putting them in suitcases, raping them in front of each other, then killing and eating them. Right. That's going to scare a woman. I understand that. And these were fictional writings again. But were they? Turns out Gil had these demonic plans for his wife after their very first date. In his memoir, Raw Deal, Gil writes when he got home, he pleasured himself sexually while, quote, imagining her being chloroformed and kidnapped, stripped naked, and laid out on a platter with an apple in her mouth. There were some sick things going through this guy's head. And Gil isn't alone. He's often chatting with several other wannabe cannibal creeps. Among them, Christopher Ash, a librarian from New York City, Dale Bollinger, a nurse from England, Michael Van Heis, a mechanic from New Jersey, and Ali Khan, a butcher from Pakistan. There's a tendency to say, if this guy wasn't up to no good, he wouldn't be in a chat room like this. There are a lot of sick people who are turned on by disturbing things. According to recovered chats between Gil and the Pakistani butcher, the two men planned to kidnap Gil's wife and then tie her up, slit her throat, and watch the blood drain from her body. Ali Khan writes, if she cries out, don't show her mercy. Gil replies, don't worry, we'll gag her. And when it comes to killing his wife, Gil comments, she's a sweet girl. I like her a lot, but I will move on. This isn't, dear playboy, you might never believe this. This is graphic, threatening, dangerous, dark stuff. I understand it's very graphic, it's very dark. And Gil's hunger for human flesh doesn't stop with his beloved. There's a section of the website that's entitled, What Would You Do To Her?, where users post photos of various women. Gil uploads hundreds of pictures of women. There's just one problem. All of the women that he talked about were real people in his life. That's right. Gil's frightening fantasies appear to be based in reality copied and pasted straight from his Facebook page. He talked about real people, real names, real dates. Gill's menu for murder includes a 27-year-old prosecuting attorney and college classmate. Concerning this woman, and again warning its graphic, Gill brags about tying her up to a pulley apparatus in his basement and cooking her alive. Gill writes things like, she'll be trussed up like a turkey. She'll be terrified, screaming and crying. These are your words. I, I understand. I know, you don't dispute that. Yeah, there's no denying that I wrote that stuff. It's just, it, it's, it's one thing when I'm an anonymous screen name. It's another thing when I'm sitting here looking at you, and I'm Gil, and I'm a person now. And then there's an acquaintance who Gil knows through his wife. He allegedly plans to abduct and sell this woman to his online buddy, Michael Van Heijs from New Jersey. Gil writes, 5,000 and she's all yours. The Jersey mechanic writes back, could we do four? Remember, Gil is a cop sworn to protect people. And finally, there's an 18-year-old student who attends Gil's high school alma mater. He refers to her as, quote, the most desirable piece of meat I've ever met. I speak about in these chats, a human-sized oven, a house in the middle of nowhere, a white van, none of the stuff exists. It's all clearly fictional. But how do you even think that up? It's not normal. It's just fiction, it's just writing, it's just, you know, but you see how it looks. No, sure, I understand how it looks. I totally get it. It looks like you're preparing to kidnap, rape, kill, and eat. Based, on, based on completely fictional writing. But when Gil's wife reads these menacing messages, she packs up their baby and flees to her parents' home. What did she say to you after she read about these twisted fantasies? Her initial reaction was to try and work this out. She sent me a text message after she left. She said, let's try and, I'm not giving up, let's try and find a couple's therapist. But it appears Mrs. Valley has a change of heart. She went to the FBI. Yes. Then about a month after Gil's wife leaves him, all hell breaks loose. There's a knock at the door, and when he opens it, there are six FBI agents, guns drawn, squarely in his direction. I'm a very good writer, obviously. I, the FBI thought I was committing a, you know, a real crime. Thought or knew? Ends up the feds had been watching Gil, and according to them, Gil has been doing some watching of his own. The feds call it stalking. He was surveilling these women. 
So he had accessed an NYPD database and he had started looking up personal information. He accessed, as a police officer, a law enforcement database. That's right. And was essentially using it illegally. Yes. To get information on potential targets. Yes, and he- That's a big deal. It is a big deal. Officer Valley is charged with conspiracy to commit kidnapping and illegally accessing a federal law enforcement database. If convicted on the two felonies, the NYPD cop faces life in prison. It's a sensational story. Oh, cannibal He's, cop. That yeah. was, a, there was a huge headline. Here. Sure, I, and I was kind of shielded from that because I was in prison. I never really got the extent of how big it was on the outside. But inside the courtroom, the shocking and gruesome details of Gil's cannibalistic chats are dissected line by line. It was brutal. It was a, it was a nightmare. It was very tough. Then a big moment when Gil's wife takes the stand. She tearfully testifies to discovering thousands of emails and photos of herself and friends on her husband's computer. He's talking about doing terrible things to people, hurting people, raping people, wanting to eat people. For 12 straight days, it's a parade of Gil's former college classmates and friends taking the stand. Each woman recounts the most ghoulish and gruesome ways the NYPD cop planned to allegedly cannibalize them. Then the prosecution puts their star witness on the stand. The prosecution played upon the fears of the jurors. It's during this testimony that the six-man, six-woman jury appears to really squirm in their seats as they hear from a woman named Kimberly. She's a former college classmate of Gill's and a frequent topic of conversation between the NYPD cop and his English pal, Dale Bollinger, who goes by the screen name, Meat Market Man. Gil writes to Meat Market Man, I just can't wait to get Kimberly cooking. They went into the chats and they had FBI agents categorize the chats into fantasy and reality. The chats related to Kimberly are categorized as reality. And they said that one of the components that distinguished the reality chats was where there was specificity and where he talked about real people, real names, real dates. Unlike the other fantasy chats, prosecutors claim Gill appears to be taking real steps to kidnap and kill his former college friend. FBI agents point to a recovered document from his computer entitled Abducting and Cooking Kimberly, a blueprint. That was a key point of the government's case. In the blueprint, Gill lists materials needed. Car, chloroform, rope, gag, something to put in the trunk to collect any DNA, separate bag to gather her clothes, gloves, and cheap sneakers. And then Gill does something that he hasn't done with the other potential victims. He ended up going meeting that woman on that date, though he had lunch with her and brought his wife and his child. That's right. Kimberly is no longer an online fantasy. According to prosecutors, she's now potential prey sitting inches from her alleged hunter. But the defense claims it's not enough to prove conspiracy. All they had were chats, but those chats were in the context of fetish chat rooms where you had thousands of other people talking about very similar things. So how do you tell the difference between what's fantasy and what's reality? Gill's defense team says their client never purchased materials to commit these crimes or communicated with any of the alleged co-conspirators outside of the fantasy website. There is no way that you can prosecute people in this country based on their thoughts alone without having actions to back it up. If they follow the law, they should return not guilty verdict. Then after nearly two weeks of testimony, the jury reaches a decision. Guilty. I'm in shock. Gill Valley's mother is not alone. The NYPD cop's defense team is stunned by the verdict. It's a devastating verdict for us. We truly believe in our client's innocence, and it was devastating to hear guilty. But is he? Coming up. What crime did I commit? And is the so-called cannibal cop going to spend the rest of his life behind bars? Ultimately, I knew it wasn't the end, and it wasn't. When do thoughts cross the line into crimes? For former NYPD police officer Gilberto Valley, prosecutors say it was when he and several other men plotted to kidnap women, cook them, and eat them. Now, facing life in prison, Valley's story is about to take another incredible turn. It was devastating to hear guilty. 
NYPD officer Gil Valley, dubbed the cannibal cop, is found guilty of conspiracy to commit kidnapping. He's also been nailed for accessing a federal government computer database without authorization. A verdict that leaves the former officer's defense team stunned. I'm sure Mr. Valley was crying. I was certainly crying. It's, it's emotional. It's very hard to hear. We've worked very hard, and we truly believe in his innocence. After Valley's conviction, his attorneys file a motion to appeal. Journalist and Crime Watch Daily legal analyst Amy Dash is watching this case very carefully. The case appalled me from a legal perspective because it was such a thought-based prosecution. It was straight out of George Orwell's 1984. Unorthodox loyalties which can only lead to thought crime. Where a man had disturbing thoughts but did nothing in reality to back them up. And he was prosecuted and convicted. But this isn't fiction. It's fact for former NYPD cop Gil Valley currently facing life in prison. It's very hard, almost impossible, to overturn a jury verdict. For nearly two years, Gil Valley remains behind bars, professing his innocence to our Amy Dash. He was always polite, and he just came off as the most normal person. And I thought, this is so bizarre, because when I was reading the trial transcript, there were some sick things going through this guy's head. It's like two totally different people. There is NYPD officer husband and father Gil Valley, and then there's Cannibal Cop with his online persona, Girl Meat Hunter. The bulk of the evidence from the prosecutors was internet-based. So you had chats, you had Google searches for blueprints for murder and rape, uh, Google searches for chloroform. So the question becomes, is all of that internet evidence enough to prove a conspiracy and to prove criminal intent? Or do you need more? Do you need an action outside of the internet? And the shamed ex-cop's criminal action, according to prosecutors, was meeting with his former college classmate, Kimberly, for lunch. They claimed he stalked his target after putting together a document recovered from his computer entitled Abducting and Cooking Kimberly, a blueprint. They only had that one lunch date as proof of surveillance. They played upon the fears of the jury and they said, is this the type of guy that you want out on the streets? And this is what the jury bought. But now the question is, will the appeals court buy it? Is that enough to put me in prison for the rest of my life? You know, what crime did I commit? Coming up. The law says that you cannot prosecute people based on their disturbing and sick thoughts. And a man who knows a cannibal when he sees one. I interviewed Jeffrey Dahmer. Former NYPD officer Gil Valley, dubbed the cannibal cop, accused of planning to abduct, kill, and cook women, has been found guilty of conspiracy to commit kidnapping and illegally accessing a federal government computer database. While behind bars, the disgraced cop's defense team appeals the verdict, then the moment they've been waiting for. The appeals court decision is in. This is elation. This is complete vindication. Stunningly, Gil Valley's conviction is overturned. And the judge in this case goes on to make this public statement. Moreover, the nearly year-long kidnapping conspiracy alleged by the government is one in which no one was ever kidnapped. No attempted kidnapping ever took place, and no real-world steps were ever taken to kidnap anyone. And the appeals court said, there's no way that you can prosecute people in this country based on their thoughts alone without having actions to back it up. On the verge of tears and walking out of prison with his parents, the man behind the computer steps out of the shadows and speaks to the media. I want to take this opportunity to apologize to everyone who's been hurt, shocked, and offended by my infantile actions. Not only do we know our client was innocent, but we really believed in the rule of law. Cops usually don't fare well in prison. Right, and that's why they put me in solitary for my protection. But I mean, it was a total nightmare. I want to go home, guys, please. 21 months, I want to go home now. 
And our Amy Dash was the only reporter invited inside when Valley got home and walked into the loving arms of his mom. What do you guys have to say? I mean, it's like such a big day. I'm glad he's home and I'm glad that this is all over. And the warm embrace of his dog. That's my boy, Daddy's home. During the ordeal, Gil lost custody of his daughter and his wife filed for divorce. Have you spoken with your wife since your arrest? No. Not one word. What do you say to her today, sitting here? Uh, I'm just so incredibly sorry that this all happened. I mean, I, I've, you know, I, I, I wish we had our old life back. Do you still go into these chat rooms, these social platforms, and discuss these dark fantasies? No, I don't do role plays anymore. Uh, I do occasionally look at pornography. There's nothing unusual about that, but. It's not like the stuff just goes away. It's not like uh, I'm in therapy, I go to therapy once a week. It's not like the therapist can say abracadabra or some magic word and poof, everything just goes away. I mean, these are still part of me. But an acquittal doesn't equal innocence. It only means the prosecution failed to prove its case. Isn't it possible, though, that the prosecutors in this case, the feds, the FBI, prevented an attack from taking place because they got to him before he could do it? For that, you would have to talk to a psychiatrist. So we did. A famous one, forensic psychiatrist Dr. Park Dietz. He has interviewed some of the most notorious serial killers and mass murderers, including Jahar Sarnayev, the surviving Boston Marathon bomber, John Hinckley Jr., who attempted to assassinate President Ronald Reagan, and one of America's most famous cannibals, Jeffrey Dahmer, responsible for the deaths of 17 boys and men. Jeffrey Dahmer is one of those rare criminals who actually did consume part of the flesh of his victims. Dr. Deed spent days with Dahmer, who was caught with chopped up body parts stored in his home in Milwaukee. But the way he went about doing that bore no resemblance to what uh, Gill and the people he was corresponding with were talking about. And the one big difference. To be a cannibal, one has to eat human flesh. He never did that. Dr. Deed spent two days analyzing the former cop. People who have secret fantasies and people who are planning a crime, they're not the same, but they can look very similar. And there's absolutely no evidence that he ever carried out any criminal activity with respect to abduction or rape or kidnapping or murder or cannibalism. In fact, Dr. Deeds calls Gill's sexual fantasies more cartoonish than criminal. Then, in a breakthrough moment during the psychiatric examination, Gill shared with the doctor the origin of his dark fantasies. And you'll never believe it. That's right, from the comedy movie, The Mask. He had a particular fascination with a scene in the film, The Mask, in which Cameron Diaz is bound and then rescued by a character played by Jim Carrey. And in that scene, she is looking sexy, but also bound and damsel in distress. Then from that seemingly silly scene to this. Dr. Deeds also believes Gil poses no threat to women and paints him as a kind of loser in love a kind of shy guy who was a little slow to get round to having a sex life at all. In his new book, Raw Deal, Gil reveals this shocker about his sexual experience, writing, that is the thing about still being a virgin at 25 years of age. At some point, it becomes less about the sex and more about just getting it over with so you don't have to think about it anymore. It's a far cry from his raunchy online chats. He's not a cannibal, never was, and in my view, never will be. Now in his 30s and working construction, Gil is still online, but this time surfing the dating sites. He's traded his online moniker, Girl Meat Hunter, for Amicable114. And while he admits he's still turned on by this, there's no cure, quote unquote. There's one thing that totally turns him off, smoking. Gill emphatically states on the dating app, no way. It appears everybody has their limits, even a guy nicknamed the Cannibal Cop. A nickname he'd like to take back and a life he'd like to get back. 
I lost my family, my career. Uh, I'll never be able to shake this, this nickname, the Cannibal Cop. That's only gonna stay with me forever. So I have, even though I've been exonerated, I've been acquitted, I'm still dealing with all kinds of ripple effects. And while Valley remains a free man, the men once called as co-conspirators in the case are not. Christopher Ash, a former librarian at a New York City high school, and Michael Van Heis, a mechanic from New Jersey, remain behind bars facing life in prison. They too are appealing their cases. Now we want to hear from you. When does a sick thought cross the line and become a crime? Sound off right now on our Facebook page.